you gave some use cases about how uh, artificial intelligence is being used um, in the developing world. Uh, so some people say that that some parts of the developing world they skipped the landline era, you know, skipped directly to cell phones, and so it seems like they can uh, very easily potentially adopt these advanced technologies. Uh, but it seems counterintuitive with the limited resource setting environment. Uh, what are your thoughts on that from some of the experiences that you had? Um, I think there are aspects where uh, clearly low and middle income countries could uh, outperform or have a faster rate of adoption. Uh, one of the biggest problems now uh, is with step one, which is uh, data collection. It turns out that we are drowning in data, but those data are not able to uh, in, like talk to each other. So they're coming from different systems. So our group, we spend 90% of our time in data integration and data harmonization, and the vendors make that that way. So they're not releasing their API so that you cannot move data in and out. And that's the biggest obstacle in, 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 in uh, integrating and harmonizing the data. Um, so interoperability, as you've heard so many times, is a big uh, issue here in the United States as well as in other developed countries. And in, the, in low and middle income countries, uh, they could really mandate that uh, the vendors open up their systems so that you're able to move data in and out. I think it's coming to the US. Uh, there are talks about mandating uh, interoperability and uh, mandating the, the vendors to uh, to release the API so that there will be no problems in terms of moving data in and out. So in terms of the creation of these databases, uh, it could be easier if you're starting from scratch, if you're really starting from a paper-based system and you're creating the system that will collect the data so that you don't have to deal with 10 vendors who are none of which are, is really willing to to share their data and allow it to get integrated with other systems. And in the developing world, as, as you know, some of the countries are led by um, uh, uh, private sector, especially in healthcare. So do you think the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence in healthcare in the developing world would be led by the private sector or the public sector? So I think machine learning the, the biggest advocates are people who are also passionate about quality improvement. Um, so one of the opportunities and promises of healthcare is to deliver better outcomes. I, I'm not generalizing all companies, all private companies, but that's not really their driving force. It's not improving patient outcomes, it's increasing revenue. Uh, so if machine learning will actually reduce treatments and tests, they may not want that mm -hmm. because they are, they, they, their uh, bottom line is we have to make more money. And if the, if the people are gonna be healthy and you're gonna be preventing complications, they may, that may not be in line with their business model. So um, to me, the benefits of machine learning you will reap if it's under the umbrella of quality improvement and really improving patient outcomes and population health. And so with the corruption that exists in a lot of the developing countries, do you think this will be a very, very slow process? I think so, yes. <laughs> um, there are definitely some countries that are less corrupt and are moving faster along compared to other countries. Like, there are countries that we've had discussions and we just gave up. Uh, because it's not going anywhere. Um, a lot of people have the vision of um, you know, having good data for global public health to be able to have disease prediction models in place. But for that to truly happen, you need to have data not just from the developed worlds, but also the developing worlds to, to have less bias. And, but how do you think this, this gap between the developed and the developing world can be bridged uh, with the existing ecosystem? Well, I think you just need to change the attitudes and the culture around data. So we have a project uh, which we call GOSIS. It's the Global Open Source uh, Severity of Illness Score. And in the intensive care unit, um, 
the patients are uh, quantified according to how sick they are and how that translates to prediction of mortality. And there are several reasons why we do that, not primarily for individual prognostication, but the, the main purpose of severity of illness score is that you could uh, compare ICUs, you could benchmark ICUs, like you could compare one ICU to another because they have the same severity of illness of patients, uh, and also we use it for research. So at present, uh, Apache is the, uh, the most prominent way of scoring uh, patients in terms of how sick they are, and not surprisingly, the performance of Apache when you go to the developing world, the AUC is around 0 0.55, 0 0.6 versus 0.9 here in the United States. So what we're trying to do is to create a, an open source uh, severity of illness score. Uh, we have data coming from countries from four continents now who are uh, contributing their data. But we always had to beg for that data. Uh, we had to find people who share our vision of uh, making the data as accessible to as many investigators and getting the most out of the data. And that was very difficult. That took us a long time to find the right partners because the attitude of a lot of organizations is still very 20th century. Like, this is my data. I'm the only one who can publish off this data. I'm the only one that could build algorithms off this data, even though that data has 1,000 patients. So the generalizability of any models that you build here is going to be suspect anyway. So I think trying to change the culture around data ownership, that data should not be treated as a commodity. I think what, how you make money is how you execute the algorithms. Like, algorithms are a dime a dozen. Like, oh, we, don't, we can't really, really reveal the algorithm. Like, oh, it could easily probably come up with better ones, so we don't need your algorithms. Like, as I said, the business model should be how do you bring that algorithm to the side. A lot of the people here are trying to understand and identify some unmet needs in healthcare. And I'm just wondering, in, in the course of the years that you've worked in healthcare at the interface of um, advanced technologies and, and medicine, are there some um, key, like top three uh, unmet needs that you think still exist and maybe some people here could uh, get involved with? So I would just give probably the top one advice, especially for the engineers and the data scientists, is you start looking for clinicians that you would like to work with. So, because in the end, once you come with, once you, do, you discover some exciting and tremendously accurate algorithm, and it's ready to be pitched to clinicians, the clinician has to pitch it. So, I find it very insulting when a data scientist comes to me and tells me that this is the way that you should practice medicine. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's an insult. Like, <laughs> I, I've trained 15 years, and then who are you to tell me? who did not go to medical school that this is the way I should be taking care of patients. It's like me telling an engineer that this is how you should build your bridge. And I'm pretty sure the engineer will feel insulted if I do that. So the only way you could pitch this and bring it to the bedside is to have clinician champions with you. And those clinicians have to be with you from the very start, from identifying the research questions to doing the iteration in terms of the algorithm development. Um, so that really would be my advice rather than giving you these are the three biggest problems. I think I gave you actually a good list of where the problems are, but those are very high level problems. You need to be able to parse that into something that is doable and something that you could really design a, a, a project around. Thank you so much, Leo.